I have a really wonky presentation. I saw Antonio Bueller speaking today, and I thought, and a lot of other people doing stuff on activism. And I thought, man, I want to do something wonky. So please, please allow me to indulge my wonky side and, and do a little bit of that. Um, I think, I think uh, people, I, I sound like an old man saying this, and it hurts, but people in your age group are really open to ideas. And so what better place to kind of test some cool ideas out? Um, uh, I, can't, I can't lay claim to any of these, but, um, but in any case, I'll get started. And apologies for craning my neck because I didn't realize I wasn't going to be able to cheat and look at my screen, so I'm going to have to look over there and cheat. Um, anybody know what that first number is? It's a lot. It's a lot. It's more than a yeah, it, it's, 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 it's actually how much was spent on the most recent election. Uh, and the second number is uh, revenues for MBA last year. Uh, and I, 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 I've come to, to understand electoral politics as a giant game of sort of kind of tribalism in team sports. And if, if you're anything like me, you, you've come to feel that there's just something wrong with this, uh, this, this, this team sports that, that, that leaves the losers um, uh, feeling uh, marginalized and disaffected. Uh, but this, this uh, idea that electoral politics is tribalism, I think, is something that we as libertarians should be communicating to our friends and that it's colossally wasteful and unnecessary. So I want to go through a couple of conversation starters before I go into some of these ideas I have for you today, uh, just to sort of get, set our thinking in motion, if you will. There are two forces for social change in the world that matter. And that's it, coercion and persuasion, okay? And really what it is, uh, what's up to us as libertarian and libertarian types to do is to move the needle towards persuasion and away from coercion as, as well as we, as, as, as much as we possibly can. Um, and so, when we, we push the needle in, the, in this direction, we start framing conversations we're having with our friends in terms of moving things towards persuasion, away from coercion. We get to the fundamental way, the way fundamentally people think about the world and about social order. When we start talking in these terms, we really unpack people's deepest sympathies, I believe. So, second conversation starter. This guy, George Lakoff, he's, he's known as a, he's a cognitive science, and he's done all this interesting stuff on language. He's really a fascinating man, and he's done some interesting stuff on metaphor. But he, wrote, uh, but he started writing metaphors on how to help liberal progressives, uh, books on how to help liberal progressives with certain kinds of metaphors. And one of the things he said was going to be helpful to helping uh, pro liberal progressives was to conceive of taxation as being like membership uh, to a club, and taxation is membership dues, okay? So one of my favorite scholars and thinkers, uh, uh, Steven Pinker, gave him a hard time, and, and he should have, because as Pinker points out, if you don't pay your taxes, guys with guns come and get you, right? Um, but um, of course, you know, you, you want to pay your membership dues, but you, you have the right of exit. You don't have the right of exit with a membership club. So one of the conversation starters I want to put for you t before you today is the idea that maybe we should start thinking about Lakoff's metaphor and, and using it in its actual uh, more, more literal terms. How would that work? So what if things were different? What if we accept the best of Lakoff's metaphor and upgrade citizenship to what one might call civil association? Conversation starter three. What if we started thinking of exiting, that is getting out of any sort of, a certain kind of system, as just as much a right as we think of free speech as a right? Okay? And what if we could convince our progressive and conservative friends 
that we can have all of our political cake, just about all of our political cake, and eat it too. Why would we want to do this? Well, as anybody in this room knows, democracy is largely overrated, irrational tribalism. I think we, we've seen that. We, you know, we, we give it our best. And, you know, uh, I voted for Gary Johnson, and, uh, and that was... Uh, and I uh, would love to have voted for Ron Paul, but that's, uh, this is not electoral politics. And when I said that, I was acting as a citizen, and, and, and complete as a citizen, and not for any a nonprofit organization I happen to be associated with. Okay. Um, and uh, our Constitution is increasingly becoming meaningless. Our Republic is being redefined by rent seekers. If you don't know what rent seekers are, uh, you can look at the military industrial complex or uh, Solyndra, you know, or any number of other people who are sort of hangers on of, of uh, state largesse or, or regulations or other. Uh, means of getting getting the profit without uh, without actually creating value, um, and what we just saw is a great example of what I call tug of war politics, where you have conscientious people in your family, your friends, on both sides of this kind of vague divide who are fighting over the spoils of what? Well, we're it's just we're not quite sure, but it's there's certainly a tug of war there, and. I want, to, I want to put forth today the idea that new social operating systems are possible. I use the term operating systems is the idea that any kind of society is basically functions through institutions or rules, right? Well, a social operating system gives you an idea that uh, I just got a new Mac instead of using a PC, so I chose a new operating system. The idea is new oper social operating systems are also possible, and we should be able to choose them. So we can move in the direction of eating more of our, uh, our politics and having it too, despite our differences. But how? New rules. And I, I haven't read their meta rules. Um, <clears throat> and I'll explain why meta rules in a second. So what's so great about rules? Rules allow systems to flow better if they're better designed rules. You know that your computer, if it has a good operating system, flows better. The things, information flows to you or in different parts of the machine better. Um, rules, as we learned from F.A. Hayek, allows complex orders to emerge. Right? This is based on some sort of rules, underlying rule set uh, versus another rule set. Orders are more likely to emerge. Rules regularize our behavior and confer a certain amount of predictability to that behavior, right? So if we all agree, say, let's say we're in our Model T Fords driving around and we're about to crash into each other, I say, whoa, whoa, somebody says, wait a minute, drive on the right. And suddenly there's a magnificent amount of order that's possible for everybody just driving on the right, okay? And, and we sort of take that for granted now. But rules are not like regulations because they don't privilege a person or group. And this is, evokes the spirit, I hope at least, of the rule of law. The idea of the rule of law is that the, that the, that the law is not m meant to privilege groups. And so um, regulations, of course, restrict our behavior, restrict flows, uh, constr constrict the flow systems, control our behaviors, or prescribe our behaviors. Uh, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, you need to do it this way and fill out this kind of paperwork. So some interesting people are picking up on the value of new rule sets, okay? And I've got some pictures of, I call them radicals for rules. Here, here are a couple of them you may be familiar with. <laughs> that guy up in the, in the right-hand corner, Michael Strong, used to live in Austin, and he's done some fast, fantastic stuff uh, in... in uh, in Honduras trying to create free cities, uh, which is part of the, the theme of, of this talk a little bit, you'll see. So, and then of course there's the original radicals for rules. We, we know those guys, Jefferson, Madison, and the gang. So could you be a radical for rules? Well, radicals for rules think some rule sets are better than others. 
that we're not monolithic about human beings or political systems. I think, I think this is an important distinction. Uh, Radicals for Rules may be open to the idea that there's not a perfect political system, not even libertarianism. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that out there and just leave it there for just a second, and you'll, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. Um, are, are okay with people and communities being different, okay? Uh, even, de- even because of genetic considerations. People are different, communities are different, our values differ one to the next, our religious proclivities and uh, orientation, sexual orientation, what, what have you. People are different. And radicals for rules, like me, think that there is value in experimentation. We're comfortable with the idea of localized failure because people are imperfect. Nobody's perfect, right? Um, we think there is value in competition among systems of rules, okay? And so when I say meta rules, I'm trying to get to the idea that there is, if there are competition among rule sets, how do we create rules that allow rule sets to compete? So meta rules. And we're, uh, we're committed to peaceful voluntary association, of course. Uh, it's part of our core value system. We're committed to the rule of law versus the rule of rulers. We think there are too many problems uh, with mere democracy. I say mere democracy because we've seen an example of that uh, just in the last month. And even representative democracy is just not quite getting us there. And we understand that institutions matter, as Nobel laureate Doug North put it, Ronald Coase puts it, uh, and F.A. Hayek puts it, and on back some of your favorite heroes of the liberty movement. And then, of course, are the statists. All your friends on Facebook, right? (laughs) So there's there's the definition of statist. And it's actually not that uh, evil sounding. This definition of statist is one who believes that coercive state power can and should be an instrument of good, making the world better than it would be otherwise, i.e. in the absence of the state, okay? and someone who believes that governments should have enforced monopolies over certain goods and services and spheres of activity within some territory. Now, I want to I emphasize territory there, because that's really what's going to make for an interesting set of thought experiments for you to throw at your Facebook friends when you get ready to, to start um, engaging them again. Um, defined this way, statism can fall along a continuum. It starts on the Leviathan end of our, we we, we initially, when we set out, we talked about coercion and persuasion, right? And Leviathan is the highly coercive side of the spectrum. And then we move along that spectrum towards uh, what one might call uh, some form of anarchy, uh, presumably anarcho-capitalism, although that's not clear. And... The idea is we want to see, if, if we're in this room anyway, we want to see how far we can push away from Leviathan and towards a state of affairs where people associate freely, peacefully, and voluntarily. So here's a question, couple of questions for your status friends. Okay? And this is not, this is not to pick on anyone. This is, this is genuinely, this is how you unpack people's deepest sensibilities, their, their, their fundamental values. I, I think it's, there's a way, this is one way of doing it. Whatever your theory of the ideal state, suppose it's the U.S. in some progressive utopia with the perfect level of redistribution and, and so on and uh, whatever the perfect progressive utopia might be as defined by uh, Paul Krugman. Should I be allowed to leave this progressive utopia in order to live under the system of another country? Right? That's all we're asking. Should I be allowed to leave the perfect progressive utopia? If your answer is the no, then we have to assume you believe justice requires a single world government that makes all the rules according to a single concept of justice. Because if I'm not allowed to leave the perfect utopia, then presumably anybody outside of our perfect utopia is of lesser moral standing and are, 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 purveyor, are somehow purveyors of injustice, right? Now, I could be committing to some sort of logical uh, misstep here, but I think, I think you can catch people in that. So watch out Canada. If I, can't leave, if I can't leave and go to Canada, then Canadians also should be 
looking out because progressive utopia should, should, if it's perfect, expand, right? Expand its territorial boundaries. Because remember, we're attaching all of this stuff somehow magically to territory, as we said. That's what statism is. If your answer, however, is yes, that we should be allowed to leave, then what is it about territory that's so magical? What is it something about this terra firma that's different from that of Mexico or Canada? What magical properties does it have that makes these set of institutions governing it compel me by virtue of having been born here to comply? All right? So what is it about this geography that requires my compliance with this single system encompassing some bundle of goods and services enforced and provided by the state through taxation, say? So I think we have to focus, if, 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 def, if your friends say yes, you should be allowed to leave the progressive utopia, I think we have to focus on the people who answer yes. Because the people who answer no are truly your enemy, in a sense. They are the enemies of liberty all the way down. I don't see any other way out of that, okay? Um, and, and I'm not, and I'm not, I don't mean, I don't want to overstate that. But I mean, no, you shouldn't be allowed to leave. It's kind of a, con that's where the conversation ends, okay? Uh, so let's focus on those who would say yes. What if I like one of these systems better? And this is what I mean about, forget pure libertarianism for a moment, although I consider myself pretty darn pure libertarian. What if I just decided, hey, I like one of these systems better despite this course of taxation or something, or somebody does. Let's say that somebody likes one of these systems better. Um, okay, I, I, I liked the S's, so I use Singapore, Sweden, South Carolina. I'm from North Carolina, so I don't, I, I don't that's crazy talk, but anyway. Uh, and Seattle. The idea here was we have different territorial systems, okay? Not, not tough. Um, among these systems, I happen to like Switzerland's the best. I think they get closest to what we're going to be describing in a little while. But let's just take Singapore for a second, and let's talk about healthcare. Singapore's healthcare system is actually really pretty good, uh, despite it, the fact that it's statist, okay? Their healthcare takes up 2 to 3% of GDP compared to ours, which is like 17%, because it's, it's like an all-you-can-eat rent-seekers buffet here in America, right? Um, we have full, they have, sorry, Singapore has full medical savings accounts, or HSAs, similar to our HSAs, but they start them, they start them pretty much at birth. Large deductibles, uh, even for major surgery. Health insurance is not coupled with one's job as it is in this country, which is bizarre if when you compare it with the rest of the, rest of the world. Um, the very poor receive assistance. It's affordable, top quality care. You're going to be fine if you go to the hospital in Singapore. And there's only one problem. It's in Singapore, right? So... So back to the question, by virtue of what exactly does my living in some geography require my compliance with a single system encompassing some bundle of goods and services provided or provided and enforced by the state? Your status friends on Facebook will probably say, but it's, it's a public good. And they'll, they'll talk like that too, it's a public good. <laughs> and you'll say no, you'll say no, it's not a public good. Um, because um, probably what they're talking about is an ambiguous uh, term, public good, that re what they really mean is benefits that, that um, like a majority of people receive may be helping to resolve some collective action problem. Anybody not know what a collective action problem is, like a free rider problem? Okay. Um, so maybe they don't really mean public good, strictly speaking, because if they did, they would be aware of the ner this nerdy uh, econ thing about rivalrous goods and non-rivalrous goods, excludability and so on. And what they really mean in healthcare is not that it's a public good, but some vague public benefit. Because we know that healthcare can be both rivalrous and excludable. Right? Okay. Okay, so not, let's not call them public goods then status friend. Let's agree that they're territorial goods that there are some things that are actual territorial goods. Healthcare is not a ter territorial good. 
neither are iPhones. But let's just agree for a moment that there are these goods that we can call territorial goods. And let's not get into any kind of weird, deep, Rothbardian arguments about you know, how private sector people can build the roads. I happen to agree with most of those arguments. In fact, probably all of them. But let's just not get into it with them. Let's just say, okay, granted, granted, there are territorial goods. Let's call them territorial goods. Some goods that you benefit from by virtue of living there and help us solve collective action problems, okay? Like, um, let's see. Maybe we like the idea of getting on these big double-decker buses. Maybe we like the idea of the, the, the county government providing street lights uh, because all the rest of the neighbors on the street didn't want to or something. I don't know. But let's just say that if they build somebody, if our, if our neighbors build a street light and we chip in, we're going to benefit from the light whether we wanted to pay for it or not and whether it's statist or not, okay? So let's just assume that there are these territorial goods. We're just being charitable to the status position, right? We might, we might say there are transportation and roads would qualify under this, defense and security, police, fire, emergency services, justice, public utilities, uh, penal institutions, uh, parks and aesthetics, nuisance, uh, nuisance courts, zoning, the idea, uh, the idea that uh, you might benefit, there might be some territorial good from making sure that um, Ronnie doesn't leave his rusty junk cars piled up next to you and all that kind of stuff. I mean, of course, there, we all know there are tort cases and these kinds of things, but it's hard to make the pure libertarian case to your status friends online. So we're just granting these territorial goods, okay? Non-territorial goods make up almost everything else, okay? These are goods and services for which there really isn't a compelling case for either solving the collective action problem or a practical need for local access or a perceived need for management by some jurisdictional authority. We know it doesn't take anybody in Austin to facilitate uh, my having this Mac, MacBook Pro, that I'm presenting this on. So even if you think people are entitled to some of these goods, I think we can, entitled in some social justice sense to some of these goods, I think we can agree uh, they are not really linked to territory, nor enjoyed necessarily by virtue of living somewhere. Again, what we're trying to do is get the status to unpack the magic. What is the magic of terra firma that makes us bound to your ideal system, right? So that being, brings us back to the important question for the status. If you're okay with my leaving the U.S. to become a citizen of Sweden or to leave California to move to Texas, which everybody seems to be doing from California, why shouldn't you be okay with my right of exit from any non-territorial system of goods and services? In other words, if there is no magic, why can't I leave? Or if there is nothing intrinsically territorial about a system that provides goods and services in a certain way, why ought I not simply be allowed to leave that system in the same way I leave California for Texas? Where's the magic? Where's the territorial magic, statist? <laughs> if you can't show me the magic, then it's what I call territorial chauvinism. It's just this basic kind of atavistic thing about soil. It just doesn't make sense. So, radical proposal. I'm a radical for rules, right? This isn't perfect. This isn't utopia. It's just a crazy proposal. Let's divorce the systems, i.e. separate territorial from non-territorial goods. Okay, Figure out how we do that, but, but do it. Let's make most changes by adopting three straightforward macro, uh, meta rules. I should have changed that to meta rules, sorry. 
Um, and let's put an end to all of this tug of war national politics. Okay? Here's how, here's how we might do that. First, political parties have to die. But we've got to replace them with something. Civil associations. So, the first macro rule is a right of exit. Anyone may exit a, may exit a, enter, of course, a civil, so we create civil associations. And anyone may exit a civil association at any time. We can exit a party at any time, as long as he or she has honored his or her end of any membership agreement. Now, what is a civil association? Awesome, cool guy, dead, nobody knows about him, but unsung classical liberal hero, okay? His name is Paul Emile de Pait. He's Belgian. He wrote this in 1860, one year, one year before the U.S. Civil War. Okay, what form of government would you desire, says uh, de Pait's interlocutor to his friend. Quite freely, you would answer monarchy or democracy or Democrat or Republican or socialist or libertarian or whatever. Whatever you reply, your answer would be entered in a register arranged for, arranged for this purpose and once registered, unless you withdrew your declaration, observing due legal form and process, you would thereby become either a royal subject or citizen of the republic of your choosing, right? Thereafter, you would in no way be involved with anyone else's government no more than a Prussian subject is with a Belgi the Belgian authorities. You would obey your own leaders, your own laws, and your own regulations. Right? So all he's saying is, is this. If it's a matter of declaration before your political commission or whatever, for one to move from a republic to a monarchy or even to Mr. Proudhon's anarchy without even the necessity of removing one's dressing gown or slippers. So there's no more tug-of-war politics. You want your progressive utopia? You build it yourself. You join. You join and you live under the auspices of that progressive utopia or that Swedish healthcare system or whatever, right? But you're, but you're essentially joining a club in Lakoff's literal sense, not in his slightly mendacious sense, trying to pull the wool over people's eyes to get them to vote for progressives, but literally, you join a club. So imagine, you join a system with a set of rules, not a party. And when systems compete, you win. Right, because you get what you want. So civil associations are a non-territorial form of association, can include or exclude people, allocate non-territorial goods and services in any way they choose, including collective. You might join the kibbutz, the American kibbutz, civil association. Members must abide by terms of membership including do, giving dues or taxes, uh, just like taxes, we call them dues because they're, they're, you're a member. Let you put your money where your political mouth is. You want a progressive utopia, let's see it. Bring it on, join the club, let's see you build it and let's see you fund it. Right? Not just Go into the voting booth all puffed up on rectitude and walk out and act disappointed when you know everything doesn't go your way. Live it. Give strong incentives for people to be civically engaged. That's what, that's what these, these associations will do. Because if you're joining a party like this, or I mean association like this, you've got to know what's going on within that system of goods and services and the auspices under which the, those... Uh, those goods and services are controlled. So these will compete for one another with members and will work according to persuasion, not coercion. They're going to be out in the street, come on, join, join the party, join the kibbutz party. Or uh, not party, sorry, we, we got rid of those, we killed them. The, the kibbutz association. Uh, actually, it's a bad example. Jews are the, the, the only religion who really don't really care about converting you, so... Um, <laughs> So we'll talk about the Lutherans then or something. Um, so now, we need a great inversion, okay? 
So let's, when we're talking about civil associations, we're talking about non-territorial goods and services. Okay? So if we're granting all these, or we're trying to avoid all these arguments and just get to the next step towards liberty, we're going to grant a lot of arguments about goods and services to the statist. And we're going to say, okay, but there are these territorial goods, right? But we want a great inversion as compared with what we have now. Power needs to push, be pushed way down, way down. So this is not anarchy yet. So macro rule tool two, a principle of sub subsidiarity. Uh, the, the Catholic Church actually came up with the principle of, of subsidiarity, and it's, it's basically federalism. The idea is that state functions, if any, should be handled at the most local feasible level. That's pretty simple, right? And this would be a constitutional, a constitutional amendment, perhaps. If you can handle it in your state, handle it in your state. The federal government may not have it. If you talk to Jason Rink, where's Jason Rink? He'll tell, you about, he'll tell you this is kind of already in the Constitution, and it's sad that, that, that I'm even having to kind of propose this, but in any case, um, Jason Rink will tell you this is kind of already in the Constitution. Uh, you, you, people disagree on this point, but if we make it explicit, a principle of subsidiarity in, in, in the Constitution, then this would be the rule. And a good old Jefferson, who before his death wrote, it is not by the consolidation or concentration of powers, but by their distribution that good government is effected. Were not this great country already divided into states, that division must be made that each might do for itself what concerns itself directly and what can so much better do than a distant authority. Every state, again, is divided into counties, each to take care of what lies within its local bounds, and each county, again, into townships or wards to manage minuter details, and every ward into farms to be governed each by its individual proprietor. This is subsidiarity. This is him describing it, right? So basically, if we have a subsidiarity rule, and we want to pool our resources to build frickin' light rail or whatever, we can do that in our specific stratum of territorial goods. But we might go to the next people who want to say, no, we're just going to, we're just going to, we're just going to outsource all this stuff or, or um, um, uh, let, let, a, let private companies manage this force and they do a bad job, we'll just fire them like they, like they do in Sandy Springs, Georgia, right? Um, so for territorial goods, we, we really need not have all these arguments. We have this principle of subsidiarity and anybody who does it at the lo most local feasible level then proves to whatever Supreme Court that other forms are unconstitutional and then have to adopt it and force it down. Interesting, interesting thing there. So why go local? Why would we want to go local like this? Why would we want to go to the most local feasible level? Accountability is easier. Democracy, if you want to use democracy in your ward or your county, is, is less irrational by degrees. I'm not, I'm not going to the polls and, and crying my tear in a bathtub in the hope of making it overflow in my favor, right? I mean, that's really the probability you have of, of affecting the outcome of an election, especially in Texas, right? Uh, so if we're going to the town hall and 100 people are voting, yeah, that's pretty good odds. Now, now, we're, now it's getting less irrational anyway, but we might not even need democracy at the most local feasible level. We'll see. It's much easier to vote with your feet, which is the best kind of voting, like the seasteaders are trying to do, and like the, uh, the free city people are trying to do for the poor Hondurans. You get more experimentation, more chances of replicable success. Look at what they're doing at Sandy Springs. Let's do that over here. They saved a, boot, a bundle of money, and look at the rent seekers are going somewhere else. People with local knowledge can carry out tasks better. Screw-ups are less titanic and widespread. Subsidiarity tracks with our ideas about information processing. All the computer nerds here know that distributed systems are generally better uh, in terms of their processing than, than centralized systems. And resources, importantly, stay closer to home. So if at least you've got to fund the light rail boondoggle, you can use it, right? People out in Bastrop have to pay for Austin's light rail. They don't get to use it. They don't live here. Come on. 
presumption of liberty. This is our third macro rule. And this is uh, Randy Barnett's term. If, if you want to take a moment to read this, I think I'm probably running out of time, so I won't read all of this. But the idea is that we just presume in, in, any, in any kind of uh, macro rule that people should be free and, uh, and, that, and, and presume liberty. So the state must exercise its power basically uh, only when it seeks to pr protect the rights of citizens um, and everything else defaults to, to uh, the common law. And that's good, right? That's good. And that, that, that tracks really nicely with our principle of subsidiarity. Is this getting too wonky for everybody? Okay, cool, cool. You guys, you guys are, uh, I mean, UT, you know, it's cream of the crop, okay? Um, so three macro rules, right of exit, subsidiarity, and liberty. Now, panarchy. This is DePite's idea. I wish I wish I, 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 I kind of came up with this idea, and I thought I was like, this is so cool, I came up with it. And then all these guys said, no, 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 Max. This guy came up with it in 1860, and check out all this other stuff, and check out Gene Callahan. He's really cool. And, and so, uh, no, it wasn't the first. But what we're suggesting here is something that's simple but profound. If each one of us, progressive, libertarian, conservative, or liberal, were willing to give up territorial chauvinism we could each have almost any system we wanted within reason. And I say within reason because we have to give up the right to dominate our fellows. That's what we have to sacrifice. None of us gets, uh, none of us gets the system we want now. You might get the temporary high of your chosen candidate winning, and you get the, sh the schadenfreude of watching the Republicans suffer the next day, right? But that high is contingent on factors completely out of your control and you're completely freaking disillusioned two weeks later when Obama goes back into office and gets back to, uh, you know, to uh, selling out to special interests or whatever progressives hate. Because he does do that, right? In the status quo, our ideals, whatever they are, will always be muddied by compromise, corruption, and horse trading. That is the nature of representative democracy with territorial monopolies. It just is. Read your public choice. It's, it's you know, come on, guys. I, 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 I really feel like if, if, if I, could, I could cure my Facebook progressive friends just by making them read Buchanan and Tulloch all the way through. But anyway. Your, your, your party affiliations may satisfy something tribal in you, but implementation never satisfy your deepest ideals. That is, the beauty, elegance, and pragmatism of your own chosen system. If it rocks that much, then, then let's do it this way. So that's what panarchy is all about. Shifting now to what the new inverted territorial order would look like. Your federal would be slimmed down to a little tiny thing instead of the monstrosity it is today. And we may find through a series of, of decisions that subsidiarity takes even less out of the federal level. Um, the state, I know I'm being idealistic about that, that, that uh, proposal, but the state would, uh, would also be slimmed, more slimmed down, but the municipal level would be big and flush. And we'd be all over town hall, civically engaged, looking at each other in the eyes, arguing like the Greeks and Romans did. And now we're looking in the beginning, arguing in the agora. And whereas now where we're headed is bread and circuses, an empire. So what's so great about panarchy? It synthesizes our two separate basic worldviews, right? So our progressives like to say they have communitarian philosophy. I say, I kind of say that's horseshit, but um, <laughs> libertarians are the most communitarian of all people, and this is why, right? We think of community as being diverse and coming from the bottom up. But individualists can claim not to be communitarian, you know, that collectivism, ah! This synthesizes that. It says, let's, we can form our kibbutzim if we want to. What's great about this is organic unity. Robert Nozick, in his philosophical explanations, describes the idea of organic unity, which is a balance of diverse perspectives 
but it keeps people unified in the same basic framework. Our macro rules more or less unify very diverse interests, ideas, and people. Reduces friction among people. This titanic tug of war that we have every two years goes away. Uh, and we have a less polarized society. We have from, the, from one many and from the many one. So what would the world look like? Government continues to exist, sorry, if you're an anarcho-capitalist, but radically localized, so polycentric law prevails. Territorial goods might be privatized eventually. Could be, right? We're just trying to get, trying to get there step by step. Could, we, could be an intermediate stage to peaceful anarchy. Who knows? Might just decide, yeah, we really don't need this anymore. Um, oh, Jason's back. There he is. We're talking about Tenth Amendment when you're gone. Oh. I, I brought you up. Um, Sorry. Uh, politics becomes a truly local phenomenon, as, as I described. Virtually any political system is possible as long as people don't exit this and the system remains solvent. So stupid systems die, right? That's evolution. That's Darwinian evolution. There's no getting around that. Big territorial systems collapse um, when the mistakes are, are, are global, so is the ca catastrophe that follows. Here you have uh, local, local screw-ups, but those are fixable and people can leave, right? That's the kind of evolutionary balance we want to have. I don't want to mean to sound like we're just Darwinism and dog-eat-dog dog or anything like that, but systems compete, compete with each other. Um, persuasion becomes the primary in instrument of social change. We move the needle away from coercion, away from dominating each other. Um, and at least power becomes checked. Competition among systems replaces this king of the mountain, tug of war politics I described, and true self-determination and self-government is realized. The vision of the founders. I close with the virtues because I'm a big fan of a woman named Deirdre McCluskey. Who, um, who writes about the bourgeois virtues. I think you should check that out if you haven't already. But the prime virtues here, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just list three. If we had such a state of affairs, we would have to leave morality primarily in, in the private sphere, in, in the sphere of, these, uh, of, of civil associations and in the home. So we wouldn't be able to dominate people for various things, religion, sexual orientation, or whatever. We would practice a virtue of toleration, therefore, that we would be a tolerant, we'd have to be a tolerant society. Maybe we're not cut out for that as human beings. Libertarians are, they know they have to be. To be libertarian idealists, you know you have to be tolerant of other people and their differences. And importantly, and this is where I think some libertarians um, m miss something. There is something important about not blind nationalism, but about patriotism, okay? In the sense that you don't, you don't venerate the soil, you venerate good rules. If we're patriotic about the Constitution, as imperfect as it is, that's a good thing. Because you, if you believe you're Doug North, you have your institutional rules that are formal and ones that are informal. And your informal ones complement the formal rules. So you've got to respect the macro rules. And those would be the prime virtues of this rather utopian idea. Oh, a word from our sponsor. <laughs> There's super wealth. Why we should stop worrying about uh, the, uh, the gap between rich and poor by Max Borders. I hope you'll look for it next week. And uh, I, I thank you very much. Do we, do we have time for a question and answer? Do I need to scoot? Jose? One or two, maybe? I, 
I, I, you know, I'm not an economist, um, but I know a lot of smart people who think we're in a, we're in a lot of trouble coming up because of the devaluation of the currency uh, due to entitlements swelling, uh, due to the student loan bubble about to be, uh, this is all going to, this is all going to hit at about the same time in a perfect storm. So I am concerned, I am concerned about a kind of economic collapse. I'm also concerned that we're balkanizing on two poles as it is right now. And if you have a radical pluralism, uh, that that form of balkanization um, and the rule sets make it so that you have to treat more people as potential customers rather than dominating them. I'm, my hope is, and this is probably idealistic, but my hope is that you start to f we start to look at each other um, as potential fellow travelers on something beautiful that we create in our communities rather than as this is some stupid tea, tea bagger I've got to dominate or this is some liberal a-hole that I've got to dominate, right? I mean, that's, that's really where my hope is that we head um, is radical community building. This is meant to be an optimistic view of the world, and I, I fear that as human beings, most of us, most of the people who are outside of this room wouldn't share that optimism. It's, it's very sad, actually, but, um, but we can always hope. Our social operating systems could very well involve, evolve, and it could take some precipitating event like a collapse to, to allow us to do that. Time. And one of the things I was thinking about is just so you've got this anarchy system where everyone chooses their own form of civil association to take part in. Uh, and then I see that you had the, uh, the federal, state, and the local chunk and what their duties would be. But I guess within your anarchic system, uh, how exactly do people that uh, you know choose to associate with the, uh, the Marxist organization when they have to interact with the capitalist organization or? You know, people who are in different civil associations, could you elaborate on how people of different associations uh, interact with each other when they need to? Yeah, I mean, um, basically, um, if you were to agree to enter some system and abide by their rules, you might, uh, you might be agreeing to not transact with capitalists. Um, now, there is one problem in, in, in that there's – there is one problem that you're going to get frictions and you're right pointing this out. So, for example, someone who's Marxist um, doesn't believe in property. And so there's going to be difficulty if, if under the ter system of territorial goods, titling property is a part of that separate set of auspices, what the Marxists are going to have to do is acquire some property under, from the capitalists and then make it communal. And then, then they can have their system. So yeah, there's some there's some kinks, no doubt, and so they're gonna it's gonna constrain they're gonna be constraints at the edges, uh, but I think that's possible. Uh, that's why I use the kibbutz as an example. It's completely communal. Once once you acquire uh, the the communal property through the through the other means, right, through just titling and whatnot, uh, then it should be possible. But to start, you wouldn't be able to the, the territorial uh, the territorial system that I showed you that is, uh, follows the rules of subsidiarity would be primary, would come, have to, would be, uh, come before the system of non-territorial goods for that very reason, I think. I could be wrong about that. Somebody smarter than I could show me otherwise, and I'd be delighted to see how. Right. Uh, no, no, because civil associations, we, I think we would have to say that, I think, we, I think the way we define it here um, is that defense is a territorial good, right? So a police force operating in your neighborhood would be a local territorial good. Um, and then, of course, whatever ter largest territorial bounds would have some sort of national defense. So that wouldn't go under civil association. That would go under territorial goods. And, and very quickly, uh, what are your thoughts on a parliamentary system that uh, breaks the two-party system and has multiple interests represented? Uh, so for instance, 
Yeah, it's an interesting idea. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, I think our, um, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that I quite, the premise, uh, the underlying premise, I think, in, of your question is that a two-party system here is a result of not having a parl parliamentary system. Um, it, I wonder if it could have evolved differently early on when there were, you know, the Whig party and all this other stuff. It perhaps could have evolved, uh, but through, it could be that the forces of rent-seeking, the, the kind of rent-seeking forces that have given us this polar system, the bipolar system, uh, Democrat and Republican domination is um, could have been otherwise. How, that being said, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'd be willing. I would be willing to look at um, a parliamentary system, certainly for territorial goods. And of course, civil associations and uh, in, 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 in different territories may adopt parliaments, local parliaments, right? But I think um, for civil um, for civil associations. <coughs> It's, uh, you could get anything. You might just be, uh, agree to what Swami says, right? And Swami pulls, a, pulls out something and writes it on it and gives it to one of his underlings and everybody goes, goes and does it. That system's not gonna be likely to survive long, but anyway. Anybody else over here? I don't wanna, okay. Thank you.